Tag TV updates you about corona situation in Canada and around the globe. You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about the breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Indian security forces foil Pakistan's plot of reviving terrorism in Kashmir. Afghan government releases 100 Taliban prisoners amid confusion over prison exchange deal. And Pakistan to remain in grey list as FATF extends action plan deadline for Pakistan. Pakistan is trying hard to whip up havoc and violence through continuous terror attacks and infiltration bits in Kashmir, even as the entire world is focused on fighting the coronavirus pandemic together. However, the Indian security forces, despite suffering losses, managed to foil all its devious agendas. Recently, Proactive Indian Defence has successfully eliminated the terrorists belonging to Pakistan-based terrorist group Jashi Muhammad. And it's not a one-off breakthrough, but the forces have been successful in busting all the nefarious anti-India plots hatched in the corridors of Islamabad and Rawalpindi, a report. In a major setback to Islamabad, Indian security forces recently gunned down Jashi Muhammad commander Sajjad Nawab Dar. Several cases were registered against him, including pertaining to attacks on CRPF camps, and he was also involved in recruitment of youth for joining militancy in Kashmir. Security forces received a tip off about terrorists hiding in Supur area of Kashmir's Baramula district, following which a search and cordon operation was launched that led to a gun battle as terrorists open fired towards security forces. Earlier, the Indian Army neutralized five terrorists along the line of control who sneaked in from Pakistan in Jammu and Kashmir's Kulgam district. Braving the inclement weather and tough terrains covered in snow, the Indian Army launched a search and cordon operation which culminated into a fierce close quarter battle during which terrorists were killed. However, five Indian Army personnel also lost their lives during the encounter. Four days ago, we got the news that we were going to run away from here. So, we were going to drop from the heli from that place. So, there was so much snow that we were going to run away from the heli. So, we were going to run away from the heli. So, we were going to run away from the heli. So, we were going to run away from the heli. So, we were going to run away from the heli. When I got the track, I got the track and 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 I got the track. So, we started the movement from there. After that, we got the track and 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 we got the track. So, there was a lot of pressure on them. So, the track and we got the track and we got the track. So, as we got to check them, we got two corners. On the other side, we got the track and we got the track and we got the track and we got the track. तो हम बैठ रहे थे तो उसी टाइम क्या हुआ स्लाइड हुई और संजीव साहब को स्कोर के दो बंदे नीचे गिर गए तो उनको बचाने के लिए संजीव साहब की साथ में कर गए और नीचे टैश के साथ मुठभेड़ हो गई तो उनकी बहुत ही ज़्यादा फाइट फाइट हुई और आपस में वो बहुत ही गुत्थम गुत्था की लड़ाई हो गई तो सुबह संजीव साहब ने एक टैरिस्ट को बुरी तरह से पकड़ लिया और चिल्ला रहे थे और थोड़ी देर में उनके बड्डी जो है वो भी उनको बचाने के लिए आगे चले गए जब तक उनको पता नहीं थी कि टैरिस्ट मर गए हैं बचे हुए हैं तो उसमें कुछ एक टैरिस्ट छुपे हुए थे तो जैसे वो नीचे उनको बचाने के लिए गए तो टैरिस्ट ने उनके ऊपर भी फायर कर दिया उन्होंने अपनी जान की परवाह किए बिना उन दोनों टैरिस्टों को ही मार गिराया जब सुबह मैंने उनको देखा तो उसमें सुबह संजीव साहब जो एक टैरिस्ट के साथ चिपके हुए द फाइव डे प्रसूट बिगैन ऑन अप्रैल फर्स्ट वेन अ ग्रुप ऑफ टेरिस्ट ट्राई टू इनफिल्ट्रेट इन टू कुपवारा इन नॉर्थ कश्मीर दिस वॉज फॉलोड बाई अ गेम ऑफ हाइड एंड सीक विद फ्रीक्वेंट गन बैटल इन हैवी स्नो बिफोर द फाइव टेरिस्ट वर किल्ड Indian Army has also recovered a huge amount of arms and ammunition from the site of encounter. This encounter shows a clear Pakistan hand with recoveries of food packets 
and other essential supplies having a clear imprint of Pakistan. Last night, we got inputs of them moving in the area south of Nohoma and in especially in the area of Kahori Batakun. We had launched an operation there early in the morning, exercising maximum restraint and use of minimum force. We cornered possibly four terrorists. We are, operation is still on and we offered them to surrender. Since they retaliated with fire, we had no option but to launch operations to neutralize them. Currently, we have neutralized four terrorists and recovered four weapons from them. The terror launch pads along the line of control have become active again and there has been a clear spike in cross-border firing typically used to distract troops and cover infiltration attempts. Thus, Indian armed forces have intensified their efforts to decimate terrorists from the valley. Security forces have already taken down 41 terrorists in Kashmir this year against 152 that were killed last year. This is expected to go up as terrorists have been trying to push in from the line of control. In terms of ceasefire violations, 1,197 incidents of cross-border firing by Pakistani troops have already been reported this year, with March alone seeing as many as 411 violations. This is a big spike from last year, when the month of March saw 267 violations. Currently, when the entire world is busy fighting with COVID-19 pandemic, Pakistan is focused on aiding and abetting terrorism. Pakistan and its army are fomenting terrorism in India to hide its failure to fight COVID-19. The Indian army is not only fighting COVID-19 with utmost professionalism both in India and in neighboring countries, but it is also concurrently defeating Pakistan's evil designs along the LOC and in the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir. The Afghan government released 100 Taliban prisoners this week after several attempts of cracking a negotiation on prisoner exchange with the Taliban. The government's move came as a surprise to many as the prisoners were released despite Taliban's decision of suspending prisoner exchange talks and recalling of its negotiators from Kabul, a report. A month after the U.S. signed the crucial peace deal with the Taliban, the Afghan government released 100 prisoners from a prison near Bagram Air Base as a first step in the peace process with the hardline Islamists. Even though Afghanistan has been suffering from years of war owing to the extremist Taliban fighters, the released Taliban prisoners claim that they look forward to peace and stability in the country. An official prisoner exchange deal has been on the priority list of both the Afghan government and the hardline Taliban. But the lack of understanding and string of confusions is leading to delayed productivity on various crucial issues, including the prisoner exchange deal in the war torn nation. The problem is that when, when, when they cannot come to an agreement on the very important issues which are critical into the agreement between U.S. and the Taliban, which actually create conflict inside the Afghanistan de debate, that actually create obstacle for coming to an agreement. One of the major problems with this current two contracts is the release of the 5,000, which is not any sign of an agreement. There is no sign of uh, such an agreement between Afghan government and the United States. Ahead of the release of prisoners, the insurgent group broke off talks with the Afghan government on prisoner exchange by calling it a series of fruitless meetings. The adjournment of meetings from Taliban's side comes as the latest setback for the US-led efforts as these meetings were seen as crucial steps in peace talks being brokered by the United States after it agreed on a troop withdrawal pact with the extremist group.
The United States and the Taliban inked a peace deal in Doha on 29 February that calls for the full withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan within 14 months, including a Taliban guarantee that Afghan soil will not be used as a launch pad against the US and its allies. The launch of intra-Afghan negotiations by March 10 and a permanent and comprehensive ceasefire. The deal also mentioned release of up to 5,000 Taliban prisoners before 10th March. However, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani turned down this demand, saying that it was up to his government to release the prisoners and not the United States, as Ghani's government has no agreement with America in this field. But the latest move of release of 100 prisoners shows Afghan government's repositioning on the issue that has put the peace deal in jeopardy since the very next day of its signing. While the Afghan government is trying to bring the Taliban force to negotiating table, the conflicts between the two sides are unlikely to cease because of the widely discrepancies between them and within the Taliban force. The current situation is that there are a number of discrepancies in the, in the speeches of the different actors and I see the positions of the different actors. And I think one of the reasons that they have come, come, not come to a ceasefire agreement is because there are lots of different uh, Taliban troops. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on a U.S.-led Afghanistan peacemaking drive has seen progress since he visited Kabul last month to persuade the Afghan president and his main political foe to end their leadership feud. Earlier, in order to bring a solution to the standoff, the US Secretary of State Pompeo had affirmed that all sides should stop posturing and prepare for the intra-Afghan negotiations, including practical discussions about prisoners' release. And while a reduction of violence is paramount, we also continue to press all sides to stop posturing, start a practical discussion about prisoner releases, knuckle down and prepare for the upcoming inter-Afghan negotiations. Hours after the prisoner release, five rockets hit a U.S. airbase in Afghanistan. The rockets targeting the largest U.S. military compound in Afghanistan were fired from a vehicle parked in an adjoining village. No insurgent group immediately claimed responsibility the attack comes as the Afghan government launched the release of Taliban prisoners from a jail near the Bagram base as part of a confidence-building step in a U.S.-Taliban peace deal aimed at ending about two decades of war in Afghanistan. Moving on, the Financial Action Task Force has extended the deadline for the performance report submission of Pakistan in wake of uncertainty caused due to the coronavirus pandemic. This decision of FATF has further reduced the chances of Pakistan of getting off its grey list even after the end of this year, a report. Due to the spread of deadly coronavirus pandemic across the world, Financial Action Task Force has extended its deadline for complying conditions for Pakistan for at least three months up to October from earlier June 2020. In February this year, FATF placed Pakistan in its grey list as it failed to comply with the 27-point action plan to control funding to terrorist groups. However, research scholars and experts recommend that Pakistan must be blacklisted owing to its constant failure in combating money laundering and terror financing. It not only provides safe haven to these terror groups, but also provide them with persistent military aid and support. You know, the FATF uh, Financial Action Task Force has been <clears throat> giving a lifeline to Pakistan, which uh, to my mind is, is beyond me. I don't understand why the FATF keeps putting Pakistan on a grey list when Pakistan should definitely be put on the blacklist given its, uh, you know, uh, the recent uh, history that we're seeing. I mean, just recently we found out that Jaish e Mohammed's uh, leader, Maulana Masood Azhar, was missing from his home and while under being surveillance. Uh, then he uh, reappeared in Rawalpindi and apparently he's getting some medical treatment. Earlier on, uh, the foreign minister himself said that he's too weak and he's too ill to do carry 
out any activities, but we do know that his there was a, there are his madrasas and his seminaries and his training centers ongoing in Balakot. Uh, there was one we we found out about it after the whole world found out about it. The international community has repeatedly accused Pakistan for sponsoring militancy in Afghanistan and Jammu and Kashmir for decades. Pakistan vehemently denies all these charges. However, there are clear evidences of Pakistan's support of the Afghan Taliban, Haqqani Network and the Quetta Shura. It has augmented Afghanistan instability by providing intelligence, weapons and protection to the Afghan Taliban and the Haqqani Network. Even years of US pressure on Islamabad and Rawalpindi have failed to induce Pakistan to change. Pakistan has been playing this double game and Pakistan has been playing this double game for a very long time with the international community when it comes to the Kashmir militancy, when it comes to the Afghan militancy. We do know that the Koita Shura or the Afghan Taliban, all of them were based in Pakistan for the longest time and now uh, the Americans have, uh, have, have had to uh, sort of, you know, in a way uh, do a peace agreement. Why? Because Pakistan was supporting and sponsoring these militants and, and supporting them within their country. So Pakistan should be he really held accountable to these things. But the fact that you know terrorism affects all of us terrorism uh, from Pakistan has affected uh, the rest of the world in the past uh, so FATF or any other international bodies should and must uh, take action and make Pakistan accountable Pakistan on one hand voices support for political reconciliation in Afghanistan but on the contrary it never restricted the Afghan Taliban and the Haqqani network from operating in Pakistan-based safe havens. Experts believe that Pakistan never wants to facilitate peace in Afghanistan that culminates in stability and establishment of an elected and powerful political structure in Afghanistan. Pakistan's ultimate goal is that Afghanistan remains a place where there is always violence and where there is always somewhat of uh, turbulence and somewhat of uh, militant activity because a stable Afghanistan threatens Pakistan uh, in the sense because if there is a stable Afghanistan which will mean uh, Pakist uh, Pakistan's area of Pakhtunkhwa uh, will probably start getting more attracted towards Afghanistan because uh, originally they're all Pashtuns over there. So it's, it's in Pakistan's interest to keep a low intensity conflict ongoing in Afghanistan uh, throughout. And that's why I do not believe this peace agreement right now will bring any results, any positive results. It's just an American face saving. America wants to get out. It's an election year in the US. Uh, Trump wants to show that, okay, we, we uh, you know, we finished the whole Afghan problem, but they're leaving in haste, which, which is what they did back in the 80s also. And afterwards, we saw what happened. Uh, you know, the Taliban government came into place. So uh, things do look like as if they're headed in the same direction of chaos. Global terror financing watchdog has warned Pakistan to do more to rein in terrorist groups operating from its soil or face the consequences. If Pakistan fails to comply with FATF, it will face a much more aggressive and friendless international community where it is possible that even allies like China will no longer be able to help to bail out Pakistan. A feeling of discontent and disaffection is simmering among the residents of Pakistan occupied Kashmir. They see no glimmer of development and end to their countless challenges they face in their lives. Abject poverty, high rate of unemployment, and deficiency of medical health care facilities in the region has left the public with no other choice than taking to the streets of POK and protest against the local administration. Moreover, POK has continued to be a safe haven for terrorist organizations, which Pakistan using this land to nurture terror groups, a report. The people in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir are unhappy with the government, headed by Prime Minister Raja Farooq Haider, as it failed to fulfill promises made during elections. The people say the region lacks development employment and basic amenities like health and education. The illegally occupied region has been facing problems for the past 70 years 
and the promises that the current government made before coming to power were a complete hogwash. इस मौजूदा हुकूमत को कायम हुए तकरीबन साढ़े तीन साल कार सौ हो गया चौथी चौथा साल उसको जो है ना जी वो शुरू है वो आगे की सीमत में सफ़र कर रही है तो इस हुकूमत ने जिस वक्त ये बनने जा रही थी बहुत सारे वादे किए थे अवाम अन्नास के साथ जो सत्तर सालों से लोगों का जो इसाल हो रहा है यहाँ गरीब अवाम का इसाल हो रहा है यहाँ लोगों को नौकरियाँ नहीं मिल रही हैं चाप नहीं मिल रही हैं कोई इंडस्ट्रियल जोन नहीं कायम किए गए हैं जहाँ नौजवानों को एडजस्ट किया जा सके रात को भी एक रिपोर्ट आ रही थी कि साढ़े पाँच लाख से ज़्यादा स्किल्ड एजुकेशन जो है ना जी वो जो नौजवान हैं उन्होंने बैरून मुल्क जो है वो तजी दी है पाकिस्तान की नस्बत तो बेरोज़गारी है गुरबत है जालत है और उसके अलावा मेरठ की जो है ना जी वो खिलाफवर्जी हो रही है यहाँ बरदरीज़म है यहाँ जत्थे हैं मुख्तलि बरदरियों के Apart from facing numerous basic problems, the region is facing long hours of load shedding that has added further miseries in lives of small businessmen. Ironically, the region holds massive potential to generate electricity that could fulfill the entire demands of POK. The power generated through hydropower plants like Neelam Chhelum and Mangla is directly transmitted to Pakistan. which holds an illegal authority on water resources in the region azaru megawatt bijli jo hai wo paida karte hain lekin hum ye dekh rahe hain ke hamare shehar jo darul hukumat hai zafarabad ya iske muzaffarabad ka jo ilaka hai is sare ilake mein jo hai na ji wo tawil load shedding ho rahi hai dusra jo bijli ka bill aa raha hai hamare paas bijli ka jo utility bill hai utility bill में ऐसे बाज चीज़ें डाल दी जाती हैं जिससे जो है ना जी वो वो आवाम तो देने पे मजबूर होती है वरना बिजली का बिल कट जाएगा लेकिन उनका तलक जो उस बिल के साथ नहीं होता तो दीगर महकमे जो उसको तसील नहीं करते हैं वो लिहाजा वो बरकियात के बिल में ऐसे टैक्स लगा के डाल दिए गए हैं कि जिनका कोई ना सारा ना प्यार है वो ले रहे हैं मुसलसल ले रहे हैं या हम एहतजाज भी करते रहे हैं इस बात के ऊपर यार ये आपने जो बिला वजह जो टैक्स लगाए हुए हैं ये किस बात पर लगाए हैं हमें वजात वो नहीं कर सके हैं तो बिजली की सूरत हाल जो है ना जी वो भी हम ये देखते हैं कि नहायत ही मिजरेबल है जो यहाँ दिन को वक्त जो लोग काम करते हैं आपस में काम करते हैं या जो लोग यहाँ जो टेलर का काम करते हैं वेल्डिंग का काम करते हैं दीगर जो इस शोबे के साथ जो इलेक्ट्रीशियन इलेक्ट्रिक क्योंकि हर शोबा ज़िंदगी में इंटर हो गई है काम के वाले से तो वो जो है ना वो उनके जो है वो बैठे रहते हैं पूरा दिन बिजली होती नहीं है वो लोड शेडिंग होती है और फिर जो है वो बिजली देते भी हैं वो काम वोल्टेज होती है जिससे बाज कारखाने बाज़ इंडस्ट्रियाँ बाज छोटी जो घरेलू इंडस्ट्रियाँ वो भी नहीं चल सकती हैं तो मैं ये समझता हूँ कि इतना बिजली पैदा करने के बावजूद हम वो बिजली की जो सहूलत है उससे मरूम है पाकिस्तान हैज बीन यूजिंग द टेरिटरी ऑफ पी ओ के फॉर इट्स प्रोक्सी अगेंस्ट इंडिया द पीपल इन द रीजन आर नॉट ओनली सफरिंग ड्यू टू लैक ऑफ बेसिक फैसिलिटीज बट देयर लैंड इज यूज फॉर टेरर ट्रेनिंग कैम्प मैसिव प्रोटेस्ट डू हैपन टाइम टू टाइम वेर द लोकल्स ब्लेम द इनकॉम्पिटेंट एंड इम्पेसिव रूलर्स इन पी ओ के हु हैव लेफ्ट द रीजन टू बी ट्रीटेड एट द बूथ्स ऑफ पाकिस्तान and with that we come to the end of this edition of newsweek south asia we will be back next week with more news views and analysis from the subcontinent meanwhile do keep writing to us at nwsa@ani.com this is surbhi sharma signing off on the behalf of entire production team of newsweek south asia goodbye and take care subscribe tag tv youtube channel and press the notification button